We gather this morning called forth by love to find joy and comfort in one another, to bear each other's burdens and to celebrate the mystery of life. Come, let us worship together. We light our chalice today with these words from Eric Heller Wagner. Blessed is the fire that burns deep in the soul. It is the flame of the human spirit touched into being by the mystery of life. It is the fire of reason. It is the fire of compassion. The fire of community. The fire of justice. The fire of faith. It is the fire of love burning deep in the human heart, the divine glow in every life. Please join in singing hymn number 20, Be Thou My Vision. vision, O God of my heart, not be all else to me, save that thou art, thou my best thought, by day or by night, walking or sleeping, thy presence, my light, be thou my wish and thou my true word I ever with thee and thou with me God thou my soul shelter thou my high tower raise thou me heavenward O power of my power riches I heed not nor world's empty praise thou my inheritance now and always thou and thou only first in my heart sovereign of heaven my treasure thou
Our primary worship task this month has been to explore our first, nope, fourth Unitarian Universalist principle, the free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We've had an overview of that principle through the lens of wisdom. This includes an exploration of the relationship between religion and science and considering the need to decenter the white racial experience in Unitarian Universalism. Today, we are going to stay on track with learning about the fourth principle by exploring one of the sources of Unitarian Universalism. This morning's Time for All Ages is about the tree of Unitarian Universalism. So what makes up a tree? A tree has roots which draw up water to nourish the tree. Trees have a strong trunk which relies on the roots and supports the branches above. And trees have branches which stretch out into the world and provide oxygen, shade, and fruit. This tree, the tree of Unitarian Universalism, is just like other trees in that it has roots, a trunk, and branches. But what sets it apart from other trees is that each of its six roots, its strong trunk, and its eight branches all have names. Its roots are the sources from which Unitarian Universalism draws inspiration and knowledge direct experience of mystery and wonder, the lives of prophetic people who teach us how to live for justice and love, wisdom from the world's religions, Jewish and Christian teachings about God and love, humanist teachings about reason and science, and spiritual teachings from earth-centered traditions. Its trunk, is the community of people like you and me who learn from these sources and are responsible for the branches above. And its branches are the principles that Unitarian Universalists use to live our faith out in the world. We believe that each and every person is important, that all people should be treated fairly and kindly, that we should accept one another and keep on learning together. We believe that each person must be free to search for what is true and right in life, that all persons should have a vote about the things that concern them. We believe in working for a peaceful, fair, and free world, in caring for our planet Earth, the home we share with all living things. And we believe in working together for diversity and against racism and oppression. And this is the tree of Unitarian Universalism. The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. One way we live out this mission is by giving half of our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in one of these areas. Environmental action, income equality, civic engagement, and racial justice. We support a new organization each month. This month's plate collection recipient is Moose Gin, Michigan UU Social Justice Network. It is a statewide coalition of UU congregations and allies working together for progressive change. BUC is a member of this network which merges resources and expertise to support the social justice priorities of member congregations. Our donations enable Moosgen to employ consultants to lead the coalition in various issue areas. Let there be an offering in support of our beloved community and organizations that build the world we dream about. 
Offerings can be given via cash or checks through the mail by using Venmo or online at bucmi.org. This morning's offering will now be received with gratitude. We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good works of our congregation and dedicate ourselves to its service. We come now to the time in our service that we set aside for the spiritual practices of centering prayer and reflection. We begin with the Unitarian Universalist version of the prayers of the people, which we call a sharing of joys and sorrows. We begin this morning with a joy from Bonnie Sims. Bonnie says, hooray, hooray, Jean Sims turns 85 today. Happy birthday to Jean. We also have a sharing of joy within the context of sorrow from Art Hillman. Art says, as some of you may know, our family has had a very rough time these last few weeks. With joy, I can say that one daughter is home from the hospital. No one was hurt by the fire in another one's home. And my granddaughter is out of COVID-19 quarantine. Lindsay Hansman has shared a joyful and complex moment in her life with us. She tells us, on January 2nd, my husband and I began the process of an open adoption for our daughter, Olivia Cadence, who was born a month early at four pounds and four ounces. She continues, last week we hit a legal milestone that secured her placement with us even though we have some time before the adoption is finalized. And she adds, as always is the case with infant adoption, there is both joy and sorrow. She asks that you please keep the birth parents in your thoughts as well. And she finishes by saying, I look forward to bringing Olivia to church and rejoining Goosh as an advisor once we are all sleeping more in the Hansman household. Mm -hmm. I invite you now to move further with me into the spirit of prayer and centering. source of life, source of wisdom and knowing and love. 
We are gathered this morning, some of us here in our sanctuary and some of us online as one people. We gather to celebrate our personal experiences with wisdom and knowledge. We gather to acknowledge with humility our own limitations and the ways in which we need each other, the ways in which we need that which transcends us to help us grow. We all have encounters with that which is both beyond us and yet deeply a part of us. Let us hold the differences that we have and how we understand these experiences. Let us hold those differences in love and in compassion in curiosity and in wonder. Let us place the great value upon each other as we place upon ourselves. Let us find ways to experience more joy, more wisdom, and more love together as we stand in awe before the mystery of life. May it be so. Amen and blessed be. I was raised in the congregational faith, which at the time was described to me as by being as far left as you could go without being a Unitarian Universalist. Our minister danced at that edge. He participated in the first March on Washington. He gave our choir director permission to choose music for the high school choir. So we sang Society's Child and Blown in the Wind for a startled and somewhat aghast congregation. He also led the ninth grade confirmation class, similar to the UU coming of age eighth grade curriculum. He challenged us to question certain givens, what we thought we knew about Christianity, about being religious, teaching us to think for ourselves we learned what holes there were in the Christmas story. Um, and we learned about other faiths, faiths visited other churches. And one of those churches was this church. So in the early spring, we went on a weekend retreat as we neared the end of our confirmation journey. 
we were geeked. Sleeping in cabins, cooking our own meals, fireside sing-alongs, boys, and oh yeah, talking about religion. One afternoon, the minister sent us outside, instructing us to spread out, find a place to be alone, and write down our thoughts about what we saw, how it made us feel, what it might mean. It is what our Unitarian Universalist sources call direct experience. It was a cool but sunny day. I found a spot to sit, to contemplate and write. I wish I still had what I wrote, but that is kind of lost in the way back times. But I do distinctly remember how I felt. I felt held. The growing warmth of the day was like a promise for the future. My 15-year-old self would probably describe it as being in the presence of God. My now self would call it seeing the divine in all. The time between these two selves has been filling and fulfilled. There have been many moments when I have again felt that awe. Feeling the spark of the divine when I held my daughter for the first time and later my son as newborns. Feeling the spark in the divine in the quiet moment by my mother's side after she died. Her long battle with Alzheimer's disease was over and there was finally calm repose in her face. And now new sparks as I look at my baby, my daughter, gaze into the eyes of her newborn daughters, seeing the divine in each of them. Namaste, the divine light in me bows to the divine light within you. We have a reading this morning that is titled, of course, by Janet Hutchinson. You can find this in a collection called Becoming, which is meant for young people who are uh, learning how to be adults, but it has good information for people of all ages. Of course, I want the truth, but here's the rub. Truth doesn't sit around still as a rock. It breathes and flows. It turns inside and out. Have you ever seen a lion in a cage? He paces and glowers. That must be how God feels locked in our little religions. Look at how big the sky is, how deep the distance between the stars. Little speck, that's you laughable speck. That's me. How could we contain the truth, all that overwhelming light? Truth is just a tiny pinprick in mystery's velvet curtain. And even so, see how we struggle to fix an eyeball on that peep show's tiny window. And now the end is near And so I face the final curtain My friend, I'll say it clear I'll state my case of which I'm certain I've lived a life that's full I traveled each and every highway and more, much more than this. 
I did in my way. Yes, there were times I'm sure you knew when I bit off more than I could chew. But through it all, when there was doubt, I ate it up and spit it out. I faced it all and I stood tall. I did in my way. I've loved, I've laughed and cried. I've had my fill, my share of losing. And now, as tears subside, I find it all a bit amusing to think I did all that. And may I say, not in a shy way, oh no, oh no, not me, I did it my way. For what is a man, what has he got, if not himself, then he has not, to say the things he truly feels, and not the words of one who the record shows I took the blows. I did it my way. The record shows I took the blows. I did it my Earlier today, through the power of some very fantastic paper cutout art, we learned that Unitarian Universalism has six capital S sources. And as Nico explained, our sources nourish our UU principles. And the principles are the outward sign of our faith. They are what bears fruit for the world to see. As roots provide nourishment for the entire tree. Each of our sources provides grounding for all of our principles, but especially our fourth principle, the free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We draw truth and meaning from our six sources. Now, six of them is its own sermon series, so we're just gonna focus on one today, which is our first source, direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces which create and uphold life. Now, as I have said before, you can always tell when you use are trying to avoid saying God because they use a bunch of loosely connected words that sort of mean something <laughs> instead. So the phrase is direct experience of the transcending mystery, transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces which create and uphold life. For people who find the eighth principle too wordy, I submit to you our first principle. I have deep gratitude for those who came before me and clearly worked hard to hammer out this language that respects and cares for the pluralism of our faith. And I don't mean to discount that. They tried really hard to be nuanced here, but what they mean and what we mean is God, direct experience of God, however we might understand that concept. The first source of our faith, the very first source is an acknowledgement that all of us experience something transcendent, but each of us experiences it differently. We are a religious people and we believe that there is a something bigger than that calls us to do good things and to affirm the value of life. For the humanists among us, perhaps that something bigger than is the power of human community. And for some of us, perhaps it is the 
the humbling vastness and beauty of the cosmos. And for others, it is a more traditional concept of God, potentially as a metaphor. Whatever that is, something transcends and compels us to believe that human life has value. This first source of our faith is an affirmation that each of us is capable of determining what that something bigger than is and what it calls us to do and how it inspires us to do something with our lives that have value. That internal wisdom, direct experience of whatever that is, that is the starting point for the unfolding of our personal Unitarian Universalism. We do not have a set of beliefs or doctrines. We are free to choose our beliefs and to chart our own course. We are, in fact, responsible for doing that work, free and responsible. How we interpret and live out our Unitarian Universalism is up to each of us. And the tools that we have for the task of building our Unitarian Universalism include our principles and our sources. And the very first source is our internal wisdom, our own knowing. We are given permission to accept the theological value of our own understanding that something bigger than that transcendent mystery and wonder. We believe that our own experience has as deep theological value in figuring that out. The idea of human experience of the divine as theological and having value is not new to theology, nor is it exclusively a Unitarian Universalist idea. We did not fall out of the sky in 1961, nor do we have no beliefs. We have brought forward with us from many places a set of beliefs which we are free to choose from and then also add to. We put a very heavy emphasis on the theological value of human experience, but that is not unique to us. In fact, it is found in many Christian traditions. One of the most common tools for Christian theological exploration is the Wesley, Les oh my gosh, I'm so excited. It's the Wesley Quadrilateral. I am so excited to talk about this because I am a nerd. It was developed by John Wesley, an Anglican priest, he went on to be the founder of what we now call Methodism. He identified four sources of Christian theology, tradition, reason, scripture, and experience. I made a graphic. There it is. <laughs> and we can see from this illustration that tradition and scripture are the horizontal planes of the quadrilateral. By putting tradition and scripture opposite of each other, Wesley indicates a conversation between the two, or perhaps the power that is found in the tension between them. The theology is the part in the middle. Tradition is the history, the stories, the mythology, the context, and the customs of the church. Orthodoxy. He means orthodoxy. So Wesley is, is writing in the context of the Reformation. However, he acknowledged that orthodoxy, tradition, has value because it is a form of collective wisdom. For Wesley, the, the counterpoint of tradition is the primacy of scripture, the one on the bottom, which was in fact the underpinning of the Protestant Reformation. Giving people direct access to scripture reduced the authority of the church contained in orthodoxy at the top. And for the first time, common people could see for themselves what was written in the Bible that opened the door to questioning orthodoxy, questioning those traditions. For example, if the disciples had direct contact with Jesus and Jesus was God, that means that humans can have direct contact with God, therefore the mediation of a priest was not necessary, which brings us to the vertical planes. The vertical planes, reason and experience. Wesley was writing and working during the Enlightenment, a time of value, that time that valued rigorous philosophy. But the reason of the mind, that's the, the region of the soul. Wesley felt that personal 
it, wait, hold on. You guys, I'm so excited that I can't get it straight. Reason is the mind. I feel like I need a pointer, that's what it is. <laughs> Reason is in the mind and religion is in the soul. So what he's doing here is he's saying that personal experience of God is a necessary part of faith formation. So you need, you need both of them. And that's, again, why they're on opposite sides. Thus, we have intellect and spiritual experience set on the tension of that access. So to summarize the world's shortest and perhaps uh, most you know, verbally fumbly lecture on Protestant theology of the 18th century, Wesleyan quadrilateral, top and the bottom, the pressure of tradition, the grounding of scripture on the sides, the tension of reason and experience. This quadrilateral can take a number of forms. For a more tr dogmatic tradition, the quadrilateral might look like this slide. The next slide, there it is. That's a more dogmatic, so you can see there's a really long um, that line on tradition and scripture and then experience and reason. A kid is taking geometry right now, and all I know is that I don't know about geometry, but it's short on the, the vertical sides and long on the horizontal sides. So this is a more dogmatic approach, and liberal religion like ours might look more like this one. There we go. Short on tradition and scripture, long on reason and experience. It could look any number of ways for a person who identifies with mysticism. The reason line might be quite short compared to the spiritual experience line could be much more trapezoidal. This is a crude illustration that is driven by my own understanding of PowerPoint. So it is a quadrilateral, not inherently a square or a rectangle. I spent like too long trying to figure out how to make a trapezoid happen, but the trapezoid is probably more accurate, especially for us. It'd be really wide on experience, personal experience, or perhaps reason. Okay, that's enough of the slide, thank you. <laughs> so John Wesley, the development of this quadrilateral, he was an Anglican during the Enlightenment. That means that his work was a part of the cultural milieu that gave us Puritans. Puritans held a variety of beliefs, despite us thinking about them as you know, kind of monolithic. They had a variety of beliefs, uh, but they agreed that the most important aspect of, Wad of Wesley's quadrilateral was personal experience with God. They trusted personal experience and personal revelation of the scriptures over against orthodoxy, which was a man-made construct and therefore vulnerable to corruption. And they agreed that the Church of England was in need of reformation because of this corruption. And some of those Puritans were so interested in reform that they sailed to this continent there were factions among them and they still did not agree with each other, but there were not enough of them to make different churches. So they created and they shared churches where their differences could coexist, again, with a strong emphasis on personal experience. And these churches were gathered on mutual consent rather than mutual belief. A few centuries, schisms, legal battles, and I'm quite certain fist fights later, here we are. Those Puritans are our religious forebears, especially the Unitarians. Modern Unitarian Universalism still depends heavily on the concept of gathering out of mutual consent rather than mutual belief. We are here because we want to be here, not because we are compelled to or we feel that we have to. And that means knowing how to make space for each other, to honor each other's personal direct experience. Thus, our six, sources, our six sources starts with this direct experience of whatever that something bigger than is, acknowledging that it's not the same for each of us, but it has the same level of value for each of us. We acknowledge that our individual experiences of mystery and wonder have equal value. And we have something to gain by doing this work together. Like our Puritan forebears, we expect a degree of difference of belief in our churches. Well, we expect a much larger degree of difference than they did, but they gave us a blueprint for how theological differences can live together in peace. We expect a very wide variety of beliefs in our churches, and we find value in that. We find value and meaning in that plurality. 
each of us is engaged in the free and responsible search for truth and meaning, grounded in our own experience of the truth. And we have so much to gain from doing religion within the context of a church. Doing religion alone is appealing. There is nobody to challenge you. Of course, the cost of that ease is missing the opportunity to grow. If there's nobody to challenge you and just keep reaffirming that you're right about something, you're gonna get stuck. You can only grow when we are challenged. Direct experience is vital to solid theology, but left without question or new sources of input, our theological muscles atrophy. And we go from a robust quadrilateral, however it might appear, to just a flat line. You get it, flat line, like, yeah. We need the pressure of collective wisdom, of tradition and scripture as an acid test for our own thoughts and feelings. We need others to hold us accountable for how we use each of those. We need each other to provide a reflection and to, to challenge our own beliefs. Here is what you said, is that what you meant? Or, oh, thank you for sharing that. I actually think about it like this. That is the responsible part of our fourth principle. In our church, we can respect each other's personal experiences and the shape of our own quadrilaterals. We don't try to bend each other to fit a mold. And that individuality, that variety of quadrilateral shapes, that freedom is what encourages us to grow. It's what allows us and encourages us to grow, to have the freedom and to have the other examples of what it could be like. And that's really what we're trying to do here, right? We're trying to learn and to grow and explore. We have found inspiration for our lives. And that's what we're here for. We're here to be held and loved while we wrestle with life's big questions and to be challenged. The genius of our spiritual forebears was finding a way to build religious communities that openly acknowledge theological pluralism while remaining one church. The purpose of church is encouragement and accountability and faith formation and living in accordance with the values that come from that faith. The Puritans were not the first to figure that out, nor are they the only but they are the most direct line to modern Unitarian Universalism. Our theological pluralism has multiplied exponentially since that time. After the merger of the Unitarians and the Universalists, more voices were added into our rich theological chorus. Each of these newer to us voices has made a unique and important contribution to our living tradition. Our theological pluralism has reached a height never before considered, and that would probably really upset the Puritans, but everything really upset the Puritans. So. By honoring the value of personal experience of God, or however you experience that transcendent mystery and wonder, modern Unitarian Universalism has continued the spirit of unity and diversity. And that is perhaps our biggest defining characteristic. We use our first source, direct experience, to guide our search for truth and meaning, which is our fourth principle. And we do that together, living and honoring, loving and honoring the differences and, and how we do that, the different approaches that we take. And that is our third principle. Acceptance to one another and encouragement to spiritual growth knowing that it's different, knowing that it's based on a different internal wisdom. We are a full chorus singing one beautiful song. May it be so. Please join in singing our last hymn for today, Be Ours a Religion, we'll sing it twice through.
Which like sunshine goes everywhere Its temple all space Its shrine the good heart Its creed all truth Its ritual works of Go now into this world as a beacon of hope and joy. Go in love, go in peace. Now that our worship has ended, our service begins. May it be so. Amen and blessed be.